Hi everyone. In my last wrap up, I stated my desire for an emotionally impactful February. What actually happened was a full month of pre 21st century British ladies and Michael and Yate. Let's discuss. I started with this Oxford World's Classics edition of Virginia Woolf's selected essays, primarily because I was planning a London trip for March and desperately needed to read her essay, Street Haunting, A London Adventure. And I just generally want to know Virginia Woolf's whole thing. I've only read Mrs. Dalloway, which I found fairly charming in a big brainy way, but I still feel blind to what she's truly about. And this essay collection, unfortunately, didn't really help illuminate much more for me. The street haunting essay itself was, again, fairly charming in a big brainy way, as were the others, some more than most. The cinema essay was probably the one I most delighted in and connected with, and perhaps she's so beloved because her essays feel so contemporary and therefore not anything that much out of the ordinary for me right now. At the moment, I endeavor to tackle more wolf in the near future, but at this current time, I just think I'm at People Magazine reading level while Wolf is the New Yorker. I immediately read Excellent Women by Barbara Pym after hearing Ben's description of it as a book about making cups of tea, and I was stunned by the beautiful Orla Keeley cover design. This is my first Virago Modern Classics, and I'm in love. The reading experience itself was so cozy, and the story itself very delightful and funny. These names, Mildred Lathbury, Dora Caldecott, Rockingham Napier, Julian and Winifred Mallory, Allegra Gray, Everard Bone. I don't even have to tell you who or what these characters are about. They're so evocative. I read these Penguin Little Black Classics to dig further into the British lady mood. Elizabeth Gaskell's The Old Nurse's Story is an enjoyable ghost story. It's been a while since I read Victorian literature, and it still has the power to pull me straight back into my childhood. That distinctive Victorian voice has the effect of a grandmother who raised me, and I must dutifully heed its every word. The Beautiful Cassandra by Jane Austen. I can't believe she was 12 when she wrote this. At the time I was reading this, I overheard a 10-year-old girl at the playground saying, I saw your mom in her bed with your dad. They were doing BDSM. Do you even know what that is? But for Jane, she speaks of Lady Williams and her great relish for claret. That same vein of preteen girl goss is what charmed me. Emily Bronte's The Night is Darkening Round Me is glorious angst, torrential feelings. I was once a 12-year-old girl who wrote emotional poems that never rhymed. I read Wuthering Heights then, but if only I read this too. O oh, stars and dreams and gentle night, O oh, night and stars return and hide me from the hostile light that does not warm but burn. Let me sleep through his blinding rain and only wake with you. Hope, whose whisper would have given balm to all my frenzied pain, stretched her wings and soared to heaven, went and ne'er returned again. All goths and punks should read the Brontes. Leonora Carrington's The Skeleton Holiday is charming, whimsical, magical, funny, spiteful, delightful. Stunning visuals. I saw her waving her hand over the banister, and as she waved it, her fingers fell off and dropped to the ground like shooting stars. The tears ran from Lucretia's great horse's eyes and carved two channels in her cheeks of snow. She turned such a dazzling white that she shone like a star. If all these books thus far felt like delightful but nevertheless airy snacks, then The English Patient by Michael Ondiate felt like a big platter of steamed broccoli. This may be the best Hollywood film adaptation of a novel. I saw the film in January and was like, this, more of this for February. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed the read. The writing is exquisite and old world and poetic and reminded me that writing is a rare skill and talent that not everyone can do. It's also very mature, grown-up thoughts and feelings, and I personally had to read and digest it slowly. 
It was also pleasant to find that this story set in colonial times in the African deserts is decidedly not on the side of the colonists, which I think it's disregarded in the film to make room for the love story between Ralph Fiennes and Kristen Scott Thomas, particularly in the book's ending, which is very different from the film and I won't spoil, and how Ondiate handles Kip's character. The emotional maturity stunned me, and I didn't know what to do or where to put my own personal catty self. I highly recommend both film and book, but they are both very different things. I realize it's been months since I last read an Agatha Christie, so I rectified that with Peril at End House. It's okay. Not one of the best, but definitely not one of the worst. I personally never like Hastings, but his spiteful yet truthful description of Poirot's OCD levels of meticulous neatness and attention to details, and the very laughable idea that he has great mediumistic powers and leads a seance, justifies the existence of this book. This month's crop of books reminded me that it's definitely about quality, not quantity, to feel satisfied. For March, I hope to read something profound, something sublime, or just something damn fun. As always, thanks so much for watching. Bye!